Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone feeling? Good, we're awake. <laughs> My name is Christina Ianian, and I'm NASDAQ's market site reporter, and it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. I'm really excited for our conversation because space is something that we've all fantasized about as kids. I mean, who hasn't dreamed about being an astronaut? But as we grow into adulthood, we have a unique opportunity to invest and actually make um, a tangible impact. From satellites that promise global internet coverage to ambitious plans for lunar and Mars colonizations, the space sector is undergoing a transformation that really offers a unique investment opportunity. Space exploration has also impacted each and every one of our lives in ways that we may not know it. Um, from technologies that are rooted in space research and development, such as GPS, medical imaging, and weather forecasting. And it's no secret that we're living in a new space age. And while most people have given up on it, these two gentlemen sitting next to me <laughs> have not. Jordan Noon, the co-founder of Relativity Space, a company that is pioneering the use of 3D technology to revolutionize rocket manufacturing and space exploration. He is also the co-founder and general partner of Embedded Ventures, an early stage deep tech firm. And on top of that, he is the executive chairman and co-founder of Zoo, one of Embedded's incubated companies. And Jordan won't say this, but I'll brag. He's the youngest and first student in the world to get FAA clearance to fly a rocket into space. And that was in 2013. Mm -hmm. And Ian Cinnamon is the co-founder and CEO of Apex, a space manufacturing company. Previously, Ian's company, Synapse Technology Corporation, was acquired by Palantir. And prior to that, Ian co-founded Super Labs and sold the firm to Zynga. And if that wasn't enough, Ian taught himself computer science, which led to authoring the Scientific American Book Club bestseller, Programming Video Games for the Evil Genius, and later the Amazon bestseller and number one release, DIY Drones for the Evil Genius. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. <laughs> All right, so let's start broad. What are some of the latest trends that are impacting the space investing space? All you're, the, you're the investor, <laughs> you gotta kick it off. The primary one that's been driving the space sector has been a rapid decline in launch costs. If you look back 10 years ago, SpaceX was flying, let's say, once a year. It's been an amazingly quick transformation where going from a single-use rocket flying once a year to now what is SpaceX flying two to three times even a week. And it's become such a regular cadence, it's almost easy to forget about. And that's something that has led to a rapid decline in launch costs. And that opens opportunity for what happens in space as those launch costs come down. There's opportunities across all the areas that Christina discussed, opportunities outside of that, and um, that wouldn't have been profitable, wouldn't have been economical, um, you couldn't get investor support for 10 years ago. And where we look as a fund is what happens 10 years from now. If you're going from a launch once a year to a launch three times a week, what does the future look like in 10 years and what are those areas that go are going to emerge as that launch cadence uh, increases and that launch cost continues to come down? That's a great segue to Ian. There's been a lot of acceleration in the space and Apex set a historical record as the fastest build of any small satellite. Typically this takes years. You did it in 12 months. You launched in March of this year. Tell me about that. Yes, well, to take a step back for a second, just to build on exactly what Jordan said, as we see launch costs come down, right? The question then becomes, well, what are you gonna put up into space? What is the business case for doing so? And as fun as it is to send some satellites, some experiments, some mission up into orbit, there has to be an economical reason to actually do it. The business case actually has to close. And if you think about what's involved in any business case, it's effectively what's the cost to get it up into space, and then how much revenue does it generate while it's in space versus the cost to actually get that thing up there. And as Jordan said, those launch costs are coming way down, which means there's more and more business cases that now make sense. So we started our company, Apex, with the idea of saying, as more people want to launch different spacecraft, different satellites up into orbit, they're going to need certain components. In our case, what we call the satellite bus that you mentioned, the core set of components on every satellite. People are going to need more and more and more of them. And if you build them in a productized way, you can actually get them built much faster for very upfront and transparent pricing and high reliability. 
So what we did at Apex was we said, okay, let's not just pretend to tell a great story. Let's actually put our money where our mouth is and do it. So it took us about 12 months of very hard work. And we built our first, not just satellite, but first production satellite of which we're building five more this year, 20 the year after and scaling up from there. And that successfully took off a record setting timeline on, on March 4th of this year. And it's operating well in orbit, survived the, uh, the solar storm a couple of weeks ago and all is good. We're seeing a shift from those large, expensive satellites to a fleet of smaller and more afford affordable systems. What's causing this shift? So I think that change from like very expensive systems to proliferated attributable systems is not just happening in the space industry. I think the entire economy is starting to see that. And you could look at that with the global conflicts going on uh, throughout the world. There's a shift away from saying we need giant aircraft carriers or big expensive submarines to saying, what if we just had a fleet of thousands of drones or we had thousands of different systems? The same is true in space. Historically, people used to spend billions of dollars on a single satellite that would last for 20 years, but that was fragile. Something could go wrong. Or, you know, even earlier today, there was murmurs that the Russians just launched a uh, anti-satellite weapon up into space into orbit that could take down one of those very expensive satellites. So you could choose to spend a lot of time and money trying to make that very expensive satellite resilient, or you could just launch a fleet of 100 or 1,000 lower cost satellites. And if a couple break or 100 break, well, it's going to be OK. I'm curious, Jordan, like, have you seen investments in that area, like that idea of like more proliferated instead of the expensive, exquisite systems? Yeah, we, we've seen examples for a couple of reasons, including uh, just electronics being smaller higher power systems that can be put in a smaller footprint that allows new entrants, disruptive technologies, disruptive architectures to enter a smaller footprint. But there's also a geopolitical tension there that's causing a desire for more robust systems where you don't have, say, one spacecraft that's sensitive or an architecture that you, know, you can take out an entire global system through one vulnerable point. So these systems going from, let's say, one big geosynchronous orbit satellite that costs, you know, billions of dollars to, let's say, an equivalent cost architecture in low Earth orbit that has thousands of satellites in it is actually very helpful from a robustness and security perspective, because it, again, removes that single point of failure from what is a more and more sensitive geopolitical system that's forming around the space uh, ecosystem. And if I can add one thing onto that, because I think it's such a good point. It's also the first time in history, I would argue, that the playing field has started to be level. Mm -hmm. So instead of needing to be one of these established defense primes that has billions on their balance sheet to go afford to do a billion dollar program, you could be a little old apex, my startup, uh, and go and build satellites for tens of millions of dollars and raise that with venture capital instead of needing billions in the bank to be able to pull it off. Jordan, you led Relativity Space for five years. You raised $1.5 billion. The company is currently valued at $4.2 billion. Then you started Embedded Ventures in 2020, and you started incubating companies in 2021. So you really have a unique perspective being on both the founder and investor side. How, what are you seeing as some exit strategies for investors in the current day and age? No, that's a great question. And when we started Relativity back in 2015, that was my first ever entrance into the venture ecosystem. I was 22. We had this idea to 3D print rockets, build the world's largest metal 3D printers. That company is now 1,200 people. Then it was an amazing journey and entrance, but I learned a lot as far as what went into building a venture company. Then what were the expectations from early stage investors that helped us form our fund and bet adventures, but also positioning for late stage investors that are looking at those exit outcomes. Then we had a surprising wave of, uh, I'd say, uh, IPOs, the SPAC boom of 2021, 2022, that led to a lot of, of quite strong chaos, especially in the space market. And space companies are quite tricky to have as public companies because there is such a discrete set of customers, discrete set of opportunities technology-wise that they are quite... Um, fall under quite a bit of turmoil when in the public markets. We saw that with quite a few companies that went public, I'd say, quite too early. So we did see that as exit opportunities in the last couple of years. But where we look at as a fund is companies that synergize well with the defense primes. You see defense primes that are willing to work with startups. You see the DOD having willingness to lean in towards revenue in programs going to earlier stage companies like Apex. 
Then where there's opportunities for acquisition in order to bolster up a defense prime, there's opportunity to be self-sustaining, even as a private company, where you see companies like SpaceX that have stayed private for more than 20 years. And that's generally where we like to see the companies is where there's uh, downside protection through those acquisitions and the potentially even be a self-sustaining private company that let's say has secondary offerings internally because of the vulnerability of these space companies in the public markets. So going off of that, are the markets in this current day and age positioned, are the public markets positioned to really support the private sector? And um, I would generally have the preference for those space companies to stay private. And where, again, there's synergy opportunities, there's secondary opportunities, but the technology and the discreteness of the defense sector, the space sector, have generally not led well to a strong understanding and reception in the public markets. That I think the defense sector, the geopolitical strength that those companies provide is much better off um, staying private. And you both have engineering backgrounds in the aerospace industry is traditionally focused on bespoke engineering solutions. How do we shift to going from engineering to that really that product mindset? So if you think about it, the reason so much of the aerospace industry is focused on these bespoke exquisite systems, which means that they're making a unique system for every specific use case. So if you take satellites, for example, Let's say somebody wants to launch a Earth observation satellite to take photos of the Earth to monitor climate change. They'll probably spend 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars of what you call non-recurring engineering to design a custom satellite platform, a custom optic payload, et cetera, to do exactly what it needs to do. But if you go back to what Jordan said earlier about launch costs starting to decline, you can make the argument that instead of spending all this money on a bespoke system, what if instead we found something that was off the shelf? And if you take something that's off the shelf and truly productized, especially on the payload side, like the optics or the camera, you might be able to get higher resolution. Maybe it's not designed to last in space 10 or 15 years. Maybe it only survive a few years in space. But you can then pair that with the other half, the satellite platform or bus that we make, and we can also then start making it in a productized way. And the moment you move away from bespoke work to productized work, you no longer have to charge for that non-recurring engineering every single time for every product, which means you can get your overall cost, not just lower, but very transparent and upfront. It's a set skew on the shelf. You could go online and figure out what the pricing is. We're not going through this process of it taking years to re-engineer it, to figure out what the costs are, et cetera. Jordan, how did relativity lead to what you're working on today? A great question. I'd say with relativity, you know, we started, we set out with the mission to digitize manufacturing in aerospace through 3D printing. We use the 3D printing as essentially the excuse to digitize and automate the factory. It's digital in, dig digital out for that process. And, and one of the things that I really came to appreciate through leading the technical team there was that design is just as much as a bottleneck as the manufacturing. You know, we were able to automate and digitize on the factory floor. The design floor was just um, as bottlenecked. So one of the areas we work on in Embedded is incubated companies. The first one of those is a company called Zoo. I'm executive chairman there. Uh, the company was originally named KittyCAD, but we set out to modernize and digitize the mechanical engineering toolkit that is used every day by essentially any company in the world that touches a hardware design, which is almost every company. And we shipped a tool uh, at the end of last year called Text2CAD. It's essentially a chat GPT equivalent, but instead of getting back an image or a video, you get back a design file, a hardware design file. And that was the first ever introduction of a product like that. Many thought it wasn't possible yet. There wasn't the technology to support that. We built all the infrastructure required, including our own CAD engine, and in order to develop that tooling. We have some big updates coming on that product at the end of the year. Uh, but I don't think I would have seen that opportunity of the digital wave hitting manufacturing and then that digital wave next hitting that design toolkit if it wasn't for the experience uh, building and growing relativity. And looking into the future, what do you see as the next big opportunity for investors in this space? Uh, that's a great question. I'd say, you know, of the areas I listed, you, that you listed as well, Christina, they all build on top of satellite buses. So definitely Apex <laughs> is a big opportunity there. And, um, and then we look further than that of what happens for in-space research, in-space manufacturing, how do you leverage zero gravity physics? What is the future of the moon? Then the moon is the ultimate high ground. That's uh, somewhat scary from a geopolitical perspective. And there's been lots of international agreements to not touch the moon, not militarize the moon. Some countries respect those rules, some countries do not. 
And there's going to be an uncertainty there as the next, uh, you know, what is a very unstable geopolitical period plays out of who's the first group that has an ICBM on the moon pointing down at the Earth. And that's quite a scary thought. So we'll start seeing the same technologies we see on Earth of communications, imaging, um, develop on the moon, things like refueling as well, where that will become, I'd say, the next kind of high ground and geopolitical um, uh, kind of touch point that we'll see activity on. And? I think everything Jordan said is spot on. I mean, if I had dollars to invest, obviously I would invest, invest it and embed it in your fund, Jordan. But um, what I would say is I think Jordan is exactly right, right? What it comes down to is as more and more people, uh, both governments and commercial entities are launching different assets up into space, uh, there's going to be more applications, right? It's not just going to be taking photos of the earth, providing connectivity or providing, you know, geolocation. It's going to be things like uh, everything from in-space manufacturing to refueling to assembly to moving beyond just Earth's orbit to cislunar to deep space and beyond. And uh, it's incredibly exciting to think about what that could enable. I think there's a old line that's like everything from Star Trek eventually becomes like reality. And I think it's happening, it which is, is phenomenal. Um, I personally definitely worry a little bit on the geopolitical side, though, because I think what we don't want to have happen is have space turn into effectively uh, a war zone, right? Like, I would argue that that would hamper innovation more than push it forward just because uh, commercial entities being able to play in that space, it becomes a lot harder on them. Um, I think a healthy balance between government and commercial is important for the industry. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Ready to go into a rapid fire? Let's do Let's it. Let's do it. Okay, space tourism, reality or still a dream? Still a dream. Still a dream, but sign me up. Like, I, I wanna go to space. Colonize Mars or focus on Earth's orbit? Oh, uh, why not both? Good answer. I, I, I'm all for Mars, let's do it. Who owns the moon? Uh, no one owns the moon. If we launch enough Apex satellites that are <laughs> orbiting the moon, can we claim that we, we own, no. I, I think in similar to Earth, like my hope would be that the moon turns into something that's a shared resource for many, many people. What technology will be a game changer in space within the next decade? Uh, top one for me is reusable launch. Uh, economics coming down. Is there a launch path past uh, reusable rockets and other technologies? Similarly, I would say a shift from uh, very expensive aerospace hardware to more terrestrial-based hardware. So if you get to lower cost systems that happen to work in space instead of systems designed for space, it opens the door to a whole lot of things. AI in space, overhyped or essential? Overhyped. <laughs> over, uh, completely over, everything's overhyped, but that, that one's definitely overhyped. Aliens, real or fantasy? Are uh, real. We might have aliens sitting in the crowd with us. Who knows? So, like, we all might be aliens. I don't know. Stay tuned for the next panel. <laughs> Key trait you look for in a space startup? Uh, grit. Every space company has geopolitical, regulatory, tech, capitalization team. Every issue imaginable, uh, imaginable hits a space company. I, I would say speed. Um, if you're in the space industry, right, there's something to be said for slow and steady, but there's something to be said for just sitting down and executing. I think you did a phenomenal job at that with Relativity, with all of your companies at Embedded. We've tried to follow in your footsteps with Apex. Thank you. If you could give a 30 second pitch to investors who are weary about investing in space, how would you convince them? A majority of returns from the private markets have came from deep tech frontier companies and the minority of uh, investments go into that sector. So invest in managers that understand how to navigate those companies. If you're weary of space, honestly, just don't, don't do it. You're going to miss out on a trillion dollars, but it's your loss. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Thank you all for joining. A round of applause. <laughs>